Yeah, hello, everyone. I want to um, show some very important, um, uh, almost well, documentary pieces, documentary segments on um, the presidency of, um, uh, of Ronald Reagan, and um, this dovetails into uh, what we're studying this week. Uh, the um, Russia and the, uh, uh, its neighboring states. And as you know, Russia at one time was uh, the political nerve center of the Soviet Union uh, beginning in 1917 and dissolving in 1991. And I can tell you that uh, growing up uh, it, during the Cold War, no one uh, ever thought they'd live to see the day uh, where the um, Soviet Union dissolved. Um, you're going to see a clip at the end of these segments of the actual statue of Stalin coming down. I, I just can't, uh, I can't uh, overemphasize enough um, how cataclysmic that was uh, uh, to uh, the world stage. And no one just a short while before that saw that coming, which uh, renders uh, some background before we uh, look at the, uh, the clips. Ronald Reagan uh, came into office in um, January of 1981, and he inherited um, some, some major problems uh, <laughs> once taking office. Uh, he came into office, the Iranian hostages uh, were, um, you know, have being held hostage over in Iran. They were there for 444 days uh, during the campaign. Uh, Reagan was talking tough about um, what he would do if he wins the election and they were still in Tehran. Uh, oddly enough, um, an hour after Reagan was inaugurated, uh, the uh, hostages were released. And I think, you know, as far as a politician goes, a really cool thing, he did a really cool thing, I'll never forget. Um, he could have gone to the airport for the photo op. And I remember him. Uh, I remember him taking the tack that, you know, Carter, his opponent, went through as weak and as ineffectual as Carter was, uh, not being able to get the hostages released for 444 days. Um, he decided that he was going to let Carter, he called phone Carter up and said that, um, I think you should go to the airport and, you know, take that photo op, right? I don't know if that's what he said, but uh, I think that was his attention. But the, so, um, you know, he comes in office and there, there's that issue. Um, we our inflation rate was a whopping 13 percent. Right. So the economy was horrible. It was horrible. Worst economy in uh, my lifetime, American economy. And we have a very dampened American spirit. He inherits a dampened American spirit. You know, we're coming out of the uh, out of Vietnam. You had Watergate in the 70s. The economy, which I just mentioned, was terrible. The hostages are, are uh, holed up over in um, uh, Iran. The Soviets capitalize on this weakness. They invade uh, Afghanistan in um, December of um, 1979, uh, about uh, a year out before uh, Reagan takes office, right? So um, the US is arguably losing the Cold War at this, uh, you know, at this juncture of time when he takes office. Reagan, his objectives were, um, were small, uh, were, yeah, there was a, it was a short list. It was a short list and you can understand him. They were easy to understand. Uh, one was get the economy going again, get the economy going, uh, revive the American spirit and eliminate the Soviets. Okay. Now with the last objective, he uh, promised that they would not talk to, he was not going to talk to the Soviets until the United States could deal from a position of strength. And that position of strength would be the military and get the military rebuilt. And he would also say, I mean, people would, people would, um, people were nervous about that. They were like, you've got to talk to them. We've, and every president has, during the Cold War has 
regularly regularly talk to the Soviets, and Reagan would say things like, "I'm not talking to them. They lie. They cheat. They don't obey. They don't abide by any of their, you know, our, our agreements." And no, I'm going to meet with them from a position of strength. And uh, that was a little, you know, that was uh, anxious talk all around the globe. Uh, but um, so in order to deal uh, from a position of strength, Reagan enacted the, uh, at that time, the largest uh, tax cuts in uh, American history. I remember it was August of uh, 1981. And he signed that. And uh, the idea there, and this, this did work, uh, cut taxes on businesses and they could create jobs. And they did. And with the, the, we had the largest peacetime economic boom in uh, American, American history up to that point. I'm not sure, it still may have been. Uh, it served as a bull market for George H. Bush and Bill Clinton as well. But um, with the tax cuts, we were able to more tax receipts, more workers, we had uh, more tax receipts. And through that, able to build the military up. And contrary to what the tractors say, the um, non-discretionary spending on things like that was less than less than 30%. I mean, it was higher than it was, but it was less than 30%. But um, so that's what he would do, just build the build the military back up. And in return to that, jacking up military spending, the idea was he said to build up, we want to build up the military to build down. And underneath that soothing rhetoric, the building down would include luring the Soviets into an arms race. And through luring the Soviets into an arms race, eventually cripple them cripple them out of existence. So the Reagan administration, they looked at the Soviet system. They looked at the Soviet economy, the communist economy, and they saw basically a cancer, a cancer underneath the armor of their, uh, their, 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 their military armor. And through free market capitalism, um, spend the Soviets into oblivion. Uh, luring the Soviets in an arms race, their economy could not handle it. Reagan rolled the dice, feeling that they're going to attempt it anyway. They're going to attempt an arms race, the uh, or to stay uh, to um, stay with the so the, the U.S. as they basically jack the arms race up again. Another very nervous thing uh, for all of us, right in the middle of the Cold War. Um, the cornerstone, and this is what is going to be, uh, this is what will be focused on the videos. The cornerstone of um, the spending would be SDI, called SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And the idea there, the idea with SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, was to build a missile shield, was to build a missile shield and betting on the fact that the Soviets would attempt this in essence, reshaping their system or uh, collapsing it all together. And both things eventually happen. So as I said, when Reagan took office, he uh, took on a hard line. He said he would not meet with the Soviets until the US was in a position of strength. During that time, three or four um, Soviet leaders died. So Ray, uh, Reagan uh, <laughs> couldn't meet with them probably if he wanted to. I mean, these guys were always old as the hills, which leads to Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev comes into uh, the Kremlin in uh, March of 85, I think it was. And he was, you know, compared to Brezhnev and those guys, he was a uh, young, you know, he was 53, uh, 53 or 54, probably not about to die on anyone. Right. So. Um, and this took and again until Reagan meets with the Soviets, this takes five, five years. And like I said, some name calling, anxious times. Uh, Reagan was um, uh, worrisome to even Americans. He seemed like maybe he was a trigger, trigger happy cowboy. You know, he, he could press the button at any time. So I will, as I'm set the uh, the segments up for you, I will um, give you a little, eh, a little short backdrop 
on where the places are. I don't, don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, the first two segments will, uh, that I will show will be the first, will be the two summits, right? There are two summits. And then uh, the final segment I, I will show you will just briefly talk about the gradual collapse uh, as a result of uh, Reagan's arms build up, SDI, and, um, and so forth. So again, um, you know, these are a, a little, the, the spots are a little more lengthy than usual compared to the short videos I show you. Uh, but, um, you know, they're gonna be important because these will address, you, you will need these to address the discussion questions and several quiz questions. So there's more emphasis, it's much put on these videos as even my lecture or the textbook this time around, another way to look at it. Um, so uh, the spoiler, right? These videos give you an X-ray of arguably the two most uh, important summits in history between Ronald Reagan and the Soviet uh, General Secretary Mikhail Gorbachev. And again, the big picture, the big picture, Reagan was looking to implement a space shield uh, for the West against Soviet missiles. Uh, and the issue for the Soviets, um, their communist system, their communist top-down run government, they it just couldn't afford uh, the same technology, or another way to look at it from the Soviet perspective would be, uh, one, the U.S. has a missile, sh missile shield, plus one, we do not have one, right? We, we do not have, um, you know, what it takes to make one, uh, and uh, two, we fire, they block it, and they fire back, and the game is over, right? So the drama plays out during the summit with Mr. Gorbachev looking to talk Reagan in these two summits out of developing the missile shield. A high drama, high drama, otherwise known as SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, in return for taking missiles out of Europe, right? That was always Gorbachev's sop. We'll take missiles out of Europe. Well, the arms control community drooled over this. This is what they wanted all along, right? Reagan never really trusts the Soviet. He gets close to agreeing to that. And you'll see the drama uh, played out here, how close he comes to maybe, maybe, uh, we don't know, but I think he comes close to giving in to that. He doesn't. And the rest is history. Uh, the president, however, did not trust him. And uh, so he realized, I think he realized the proposal of, of SDI uh, had the political existence of uh, putting the Soviets on the ropes. I think they were on the ropes uh, with this, as long as it was in the laboratory. And one last thing to keep in mind when watching, this is a PBS publication, which is not a Republican conservative bastion, okay? Uh, so uh, if you're thinking this is looking at what Reagan did favorably, I would just give any of that, any of any favorable viewpoints there, favorable favorable coverage uh, to PBS, uh, not a conservative, uh, not a conservative uh, outfit, uh, you know, trying to cover it as it was, right? It was, um, wasn't hard to ignore. So, and also even maybe more importantly, you're gonna hear several comments by Soviets who were there during that time period, as well as Mikhail Gorbachev, right? So. Uh, these are not, um, um, you know, this is not some uh, Republican puff piece, okay? So again, not necessarily from the perspective of Reaganites. So uh, high drama. These summits uh, were not for the government uh, uh, ruling classes and international bureaucrats to get together and assert their importance uh, via some long drawn out process. Uh, to get bogged down in and have another expensive taxpayer funded junket either. Uh, the results of these summits affected how the Soviets did business, which heavily implied by PBS, again, led to the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, the Soviet communist bloc, and eventually the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. Thus, um, the world changed. 
So let's um, take a look at these and um, get these up and going. And um, here we go. In Geneva. The first summit. Here's the first summit. First meeting with Reagan and Estovia. Ronald Reagan had warned that the Soviets cheat and lie. He had opposed every arms deal American presidents had made with the Soviets in the 1970s. But he arrived in Geneva in November 1985, confident that he could handle the new leader of the evil empire. Conservative Republicans for 50 years had tended to denigrate the importance of personal diplomacy. It's, it's the legacy of the Yalta Conference. And they thought FDR had sold us out. And then we sold out China. We were always selling out someone. And uh, the sale was usually by a president who thought that if only he could get in a room with his Soviet counterpart, uh, that, uh, that his charm and his arguments would prevail. Um, that's the conservative tradition. And yet Reagan clearly believed that uh, he could do that, that the force of his personality and uh, of his arguments, uh, and above all, of his sincerity, would impress themselves upon the Soviets. Secretary Weinberger was less sure. His letter urging Reagan not to hamstring SDI was leaked to the press and seen as an effort to sabotage the summit. Mikhail Gorbachev, General Secretary of the Communist Party, came to Geneva to negotiate with the man Yuri Andropov had considered impossible, called mad, compared to Hitler. The vigorous 54-year-old, whose charming smile was said to hide teeth of iron, had come to meet the 74-year-old president who had railed against communism for almost 40 years. I felt a strong fear, a palpable sense of fear throughout the delegation that this young, formidably intelligent, aggressive Soviet leader was going to run rings around our gentle, slow, slightly doddery, aging president. The American delegation was afraid that he was going to be outsmarted, outmaneuvered, and diplomatically, perhaps, destroyed. What's the, what's the, what's the first priority? Peace. Reagan had lots to worry about, including a chore at the Aga Khan's villa where he stayed. My friend, Sally, said to me, now there's just one thing. My son has some goldfish that he adores. And would you mind feeding the goldfish in the morning? And Ronnie, of course, right away, well, of course, absolutely. And one morning, he went into the little boy's room, and one goldfish was dead. Well, I thought Ronnie was going to die. He, he called everybody in there, and he said, you've got to get a gold, take this goldfish out and find one that looks exactly like it so that we can replace this. The goldfish replaced, it was time to meet Mikhail Gorbachev. And I see it now in memory in slow motion. It is supremely dramatic. This great gleaming black gazelle comes, whispering round the corner, on the gravel, crunches to a halt. Down the stairs comes this great gliding blue-suited, unbelievably self-confident and calm president, without a coat on, in the freezing air. And out of the big black Russian limousine comes this awkward, short, rather dumpy, 
heavily overcoated, heavily scarfed, hatted communist leader who fumbled with his scarf and fumbled with his coat as he approached this great benign presence. When they met at the foot of the stairs, Reagan towered over Gorbachev. Gorbachev looked up into Reagan's face, looked at him very intensely. Reagan smiled down at him and then gently choreographed him up the stairs. Gorbachev's in standard Politburo hat, standard Politburo overcoat. It reminds me of the KGB agent from bad American films. <laughs> so I said to myself that we have lost the first, this fourth opportunity, we have lost this first round. When the delegations met, Reagan recalled, I took Gorbachev through the long history of Soviet aggression. I wanted to explain why the free world had good reason to put up its guard against the Soviet bloc. His language was brutal. He would say things like, let me tell you, Mr. General Secretary, why we fear you and why we despise your system. Now that, in a diplomatic meeting is extremely confrontational language. President, uh, the president from the very start started to speak in a kind of lecturing uh, tone, as though I was uh, a suspect or uh, maybe a student. And I cut him short. I said, Mr. President, you are not a prosecutor. I'm not the accused. You're not a teacher, I'm not a student. But Reagan somehow was able to say things like that. But at the same time, he seemed to have a sweetness and a benign quality about him that neutralized, or at least took the edge off, what uh, from Richard Nixon would seem like a declaration of war. To ease the tension, Reagan suggested they talk in private as they walked to a less formal house by the lake. They chatted about Reagan's movie career, the first time they had talked as human beings. Gorbachev immediately started to like Reagan. That was a very surprising thing. I think uh, uh, Reagan had something which was so dear to Gorbachev, and that is sincerity. This human vision and human touch and when he talked with our leaders, he talked very emotional. And he came across. This is a human being. He's trying to explain himself to you. So it may, maybe for the first time, our leaders started to think that on the other side, it's not a machine. It's not some robot. But I think that people don't reckon with the power of charm <laughs> and just personal persuasiveness. And, you know, when my father kind of turns the high beams on, uh, even, even somebody like Gorbachev tends to melt. As they walked back to rejoin their delegations, Reagan invited Gorbachev to Washington. Gorbachev reciprocated with an invitation to Moscow. On the second day, Reagan found Gorbachev ready to talk about building down their arsenals, but determined to kill SDI. Reagan resisted. Gorbachev was visibly uh, irritated. He said, why are you are repeating the same and the same thing to me? I've heard that many times. Stop this uh, rubbish. Tell me something more. It was literally so. It was a harsh discussion. But at the end, the mood was warm. Reagan left Geneva with SDI intact and an agreement. A nuclear war cannot be won 
and must never be fought. The world breathed a sigh of relief. There was another communique to Hussein Aga Khan and his parents. Dear friends, on Tuesday, I found one of your fish dead in the bottom of the tank. I don't know what could have happened, but I added two new ones, same kind. I hope this was all right. Thanks for letting us live in your lovely home. Ronald Reagan. I haven't gotten such a reception since I was shot, Reagan would quip. The image of Ronald Reagan as a trigger-happy cowboy had begun to fade. Okay, um, he moved to um, Reagan's prestige hit its high. The second the summit. 1986, as he stood on the decks of the John F. Kennedy, and pushed a button which sent a laser a mile across New York Harbor. At Reykjavik, the, the refurbished first, symbol the first of the American at, um, Geneva, Switzerland. Years of Reagan's presidency. And uh, we're going to move into, here we go. I, Reykjavik, Iceland. Mr. President, I'm here because there's a lot of people worried that uh, you're going to go to Reykjavik and give away the store. And he said, Lynn, he said, Linwood, because he always called me Linwood, which is not my name. He said, Linwood, I don't want you ever to worry about that. He said, I still have the scars on my back from when I fought the communists in Hollywood. He said, don't ever worry about it. Why you feed him? Yeah. Gorbachev had his own problems. He needed an arms agreement. He could not manage both economic reform and the arms race, especially SDI. He would try his best to make Reagan give away the store. Proposed to him a package beyond all the expectation to talk real big. Saying that was his idea. Oh, why? Do we shall discuss all these small things. Let's come up with a big idea and sell it. Gorbachev offered Reagan everything he had wanted. They would both destroy half their long-range bombers and missiles, eliminate all the missiles threatening Europe. And he made a major concession on human rights. They agreed for the first time that human rights would be a legitimate, recognized, regular uh, item on our agenda. They agreed to that. That was a breakthrough. And with all due respect to the arms control breakthroughs, when you are breaking through on the nature of the relation between a government and its people, you're really getting a lot deeper than uh, perhaps you think. Gorbachev, Secretary Schultz wrote, laid gifts at our feet. The delegations worked all night to iron out the details of his proposal. Next morning, Gorbachev insisted that all the missile reductions he proposed were contingent on restricting SDI research to the laboratory. Reagan refused. The meeting appeared to be over. He wanted to get out of there and be home. Uh, he wanted to be home for dinner that night, if at all possible, and with the change in hours. If he left in the early afternoon, he could be home in Washington for dinner. And Matter of fact, I remember his talking to me about that, saying, Don, these things are really dragging on. And I had to say to him, hang in there, Mr. President, I think we're winning. 
Mr. President, have you made any real progress, sir? We're not through. Are you going to meet? Are you going to meet again, sir? Yes. At this point, the Soviets challenged the Americans to make a concession. The U.S. delegation did. It agreed to abide by the treaty banning space defenses for 10 years, and proposed that during that time, both sides scrap all, not just half, their long-range missiles. Reagan liked the boldness of the proposal. Reagan responded with the idea of having uh, uh, the complete elimination of uh, strategic ballistic missiles. And Gorbachev said, how about eliminating all the nuclear weapons uh, uh, instead of just going part by part? They, uh, they actually uh, moved each other to the direction of the discussion of the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. They were carried away. The two gentlemen were carried away with the historic ideas they have presented to each other. It's easy to say that President Reagan was anti-communist or anti-something. No, he was a romantic. As uh, I uh, later on judge, he really was might be the last romantic of this generation. Gorbachev also had a romantic abolitionist vision of nuclear weapons. You've got the two leaders of these two powerful countries running way beyond their arms controllers and their defense ministries and their state departments and saying, let's get rid of nuclear weapons. There was a timeout asked by the American side, and Gorbachev walked out, and we were sitting in a, in a small room, uh, and he said, if Reagan accepts, the world will be a, a new one. Things will change historically. Reagan could realize his dream of reducing the nuclear threat, perhaps only by risking his dream of a space defense. Gorbachev still insisted on restricting SDI research to the laboratory. The president needed to understand, he needed information uh, in a very tense situation. Uh, when asked, uh, uh, I expressed the categorical view that uh, there was no way you could see the program through to a success, successful conclusion if we accepted the constraints that Gorbachev had in mind. Upon hearing that, he turned to Don Regan and said, if we agree to this, won't we be doing that simply so we can leave here with an agreement? And it was a rhetorical question, of course, and you knew the moment he put it that he'd made his decision. And within seconds, uh, it was over. Presidents grasp at treaties because they convey an image of presidents as uh, statesmen and peacemakers, and uh, they're sometimes not bothered about the details. It took tremendous discipline for Ronald Reagan to leave that little room without an agreement. I still think we can find a deal, Reagan said. Gorbachev replied, I don't know what else I could have done. He got into the car and his shoulders slumped. He was in the back seat. He would have thought that he had just lost a combination of the Rose Bowl and the Stanley Cup and uh, the Olympics. He was uh, so down. I've never seen a guy so beaten in all my life. He said, Don, we were that close, and he held up his left hand, just finger and thumb that much. He said, we were that close to getting rid of all missiles. And he said he wouldn't he'd give in. He kept insisting that we had to do away with SDI, and I couldn't do that. He said, I promised the American people I would not give in on that. I cannot do it. At the time, Reykjavik was considered a failure. 
Conservatives criticized Reagan for the deep cuts he was willing to make in nuclear weapons, for almost giving away the store. Margaret Thatcher worried he was bargaining away Europe's security. The mainstream press faulted him for walking away from the most sweeping offer of arms reductions in history, for sinking a summit by being so stubborn on Star Wars. Gorbachev stressed the positive. I said to the reporters that indeed Reykjavik was a breakthrough. And I said Reykjavik will eventually produce results. And that is exactly what happened. Without Reykjavik, the process that eventually started and that brought about the one treaty and further treaties, that would not have been possible. Reykjavik is the really a top of the hill, and from that top we saw a great deal. When Gorbachev visited me at Stanford University after we were both out of office, I said to him, when you entered office and when I entered office, the Cold War could not have been colder. And when we left, it was basically over. What do you think was the turning point? And he said, without any hesitation, just like that, he said, Reykjavik. And I said, why? Expecting him to talk about missiles and stuff like that. He said, because for the first time, the two leaders really had a deep conversation about everything. We really exchanged views, and not just about peripheral things, about the central things. And that was what was important about Reykjavik. Okay, I'm going to shift to the last segment here, and this is um, going to talk about the results of um, you know these two summits and how the um, you know some of the high points of how the Soviet Union uh, performed splendidly. Eventually, at the end of the meeting, they resolved. Let me see if we get set it the up. right time up here. Seven. He writes in his diary. Dick and Patty came after dinner. At Reykjavik, he had tried to link these reductions to Reagan's giving up SDM forces in half would be ready for President Bush to sign. Bill go November 18, 1981, when I first proposed what would come to be called the zero option. It was a simple proposal, one might say disarmingly simple. <laughs> for the first time in the nuclear age, a treaty would reduce nuclear weapons. Another, cutting long-range missile forces in half, would be ready for President Bush to sign. Building up to build down produced results that made the goals of the freeze movement seem modest. It was historic. And I remember him expressing his pleasure that it was done. And I remember him pushing me hard for how the Senate was going to treat it. But I don't think I ever heard him crow about that. Thinking back on it, Ronald Reagan never crowed about anything. I don't think I ever heard him make an immodest statement about his own achievements. He, 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 was, uh, he was very straightforward and very modest man. The vocal conservatives now wrote off Ronald Reagan. Columnist George Will accused him of accelerating America's intellectual disarmament and succumbing fully to the arms control chimera. Others called him a useful idiot for Soviet propaganda and an apologist for Gorbachev. historic achievement and he was very pleased and happy about it 
But I think he regarded it as an interim step in um, the progression he was making toward his real goal, which was the elimination of totalitarianism from the surface of the earth. Meine Damen und Herren, Mr. Ronald Reagan und Mrs. Nancy Reagan. The one thing that Reagan was more passionate about than anything other was the unsupportable phenomenon of totalitarian power, enslaving a large part of the world's population. In other words, what he was really looking forward to was the collapse of Soviet communism. He wanted to see the wall come down. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He wanted to see free elections and freedom and liberty and Christianity in Russia. It's as simple as that. Reagan's mission to Moscow in May 1988 was his final crusade. It began with a threat that forced the Soviets to let a Jewish couple emigrate. He said, well, on the way to the Kremlin, what I'm going to do is go to the apartment of this couple that you're not allowing to emigrate and visit with them. With 2,000 press all on, you know. So he said that that's what he intended to do. By this time, they knew Ronald Reagan well enough to know that if he said that was what he was going to do, he would do it. He did not uh, make idle threats. The next day, he mortified the Soviets by entertaining 100 dissidents at the U.S. Embassy on human rights, on the fundamental dignity of the human person, there can be no relenting. For now, we must work for more, always more. At the Danilov Monastery, he pushed for more religious freedom. Our people feel it keenly when religious freedom is denied to anyone anywhere and hope with you that all the many Soviet religious communities will soon be able to practice their religion freely and instruct their children in the fundamentals of their faith. At Moscow State University, Reagan tried to convert the next generation of Soviet leaders with his simple message of freedom. Your generation is living in one of the most exciting, hopeful times in Soviet history. It is a time when the first breath of freedom stirs the air and the heart beats to the accelerated rhythm of hope, when the accumulated spiritual energies of a long silence yearn to break free. We do not know what the conclusion of this will be of this journey, but we're hopeful that the promise of reform will be fulfilled. In this Moscow spring, this May 1988, we may be allowed that hope. Until the end, Ronald Reagan tried to undermine the foundations of communist rule, to preach his dream of freedom. In his convictions, he never changed. But his behavior did change. He found a communist he could trust. But before things get too far out of hand, we find ourselves standing like this. He was a different man by the end of the ages from what he was at the beginning of the ages. And he realized the importance of the improved relationship with the Soviet Union, and he has personally contributed to that very, very much. And that has changed the world. It presented the scene for the end of the Cold War completely, which happened just several uh, couple of years after that. You still think you're in an evil empire, Mr. President? No. Why not? I was talking about another time and another era. 
заявлении как бы сфокусировалось. This statement, I think, really focused, concentrated all the changes that happened to Ronald Reagan himself. It means that even a person who had had a kind of bias and who was uh, at an age when um, it's not easy to change, he showed that he was uh, able and ready to change his position, to change his evaluation. So he is really a very big uh, person, a very great political leader, and uh, well, the rest is up to you. When Reagan was in Moscow in May 1988, the Cold War was ending. He never expected the tide would turn so quickly. That same month, Gorbachev began withdrawing Soviet forces from Afghanistan. The next year, in June 1989, Lech Walesa was elected president of Poland. Gorbachev refused to intervene. As Reagan had foreseen, the rest of Eastern Europe followed. In November 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. In February 1990, in free elections in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas were voted out of power. Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet system's best response to the challenge of Ronald Reagan, could not control the reforms he had begun. On Christmas Day, 1991, he dissolved the Soviet Union. What Reagan had predicted before Parliament came true. The Soviet Union was consigned to the ash heap of history. Can't deny. All right. Well, there you have an incredible, incredible story, uh, political story. Um, just to kind of wrap that up, I, um, Gorbachev. He could see what was happening. He couldn't talk Reagan out of SDI. So he could see, kind of see what was happening. He could see what was happening. So he began to enact uh, economic and uh, political reforms all across the Eastern Bloc. And uh, perestroika was um, e the economic reforms, some capitalist type reforms. And glasnost was where you could actually begin to some, with some limits, to be able to write and talk about the government and um, all over the communist bloc. And the genie was kind of out of the bottle at that point. People did not want to go back <laughs> to the way it was, right? And uh, that led to, um, you know, all the independence around the Soviet bloc, communist bloc, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so, and like I said, the rest is history. Uh, the world had uh, definitely changed uh, so much uh, through those two summits. Uh, that was the uh, kind of the, uh, the cornerstone of it all. So there you have it. Um, this will be, uh, again, uh, worth a lot, uh, these videos and uh, with the discussion questions and the uh, quizzes. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Have a, have a great one. Bye-bye.